welcome everybody to the webinar and thank you for taking the time to listen to us uh, this afternoon. So I'm Louis Hall, CEO and founder of Cerulean. We founded Cerulean back in 1999 as an MBO from a company that was then Logica, uh, which was a quite a large UK software house at the time. Um, we we went, out, went out to the market, raised priority funding, um, invested in building the business over the next 15 years or so, and uh, then exited the private equity and we did the IPO in 2016. Andrew, would you like to get, introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, sure. So I started uh, back in February 2022, so coming on for 18 months ago. Before that, I worked for Vitech for about seven years, and I started my career at Deloitte where I did my accountancy qualifications. Thank you, Andrew. So what does Cerulean do? We provide the enterprise software layer that sits between telecoms, businesses, customers, and their networks. So this is a diagram of the different product modules that we provide, and we provide all of the software that enables telecom businesses to create the products they sell to their customers. And bearing in mind that most telcos these days, uh, telecoms companies are selling um, what we call quad play. So that's a combination of mobile, broadband, fixed wire, and uh, TV services um, in quite complex bundles. Um, and that requires some quite complex software. We also provide all the software that enables telecoms businesses to onboard their customers, whether that's through CRM in call centers or retail outlets or through self-service where customers onboard themselves or through mobile apps. We also provide software that then connects those services to the networks that monitors each of those services, puts charges for those services onto bills, collects payments, manages collections, and so on. And again, other peripheral modules that sit around this area. So this is absolutely at the core of everything that, that telcos do. It's not nice to have, it's mission critical. Um, I guess our USP in the market is that we provide this already pre-integrated together. So you don't need to have your own hardware or your own IT department. We provide this as a service working out the box on day one. In terms of the business model and revenue model, if you like, we sell customers a subscription service. That subscription fee covers licensing for the use of the products. It covers the support and maintenance of those products. It also covers what we call managed service, which is us operating the solution, as I was saying before, on the customer's behalf, and also us hosting that solution either in public or private cloud. In addition to that, we will also, for a new customer, provide implementation services to put that solution into production. And because these are large solutions and they're essentially digital transformation projects across the whole breadth of the business, they typically take nine to 12 to maybe 15 or in some cases even 18 months to complete. Having said that, that's a very short project for this kind of engagement, mainly because we're starting with all customers having the same product. There is no change to the product when we deliver it to a new customer, or at least there's not very much change. Uh, very rarely we, are, we, are we writing new code. Um, and all the work we're doing is around understanding requirements and, and then doing configuration and data migration. So in terms of the revenue model, so in addition to a sort of a quarterly SaaS subscription fee, we're charging a implementation services fee to put the software into use. That is recognized over the term of the project. So if the project lasts 12 months, we recognize revenue for that over that 12 month period against project milestones. For the subscription fee, and then the customer sees one fee, internally we break that out into a license fee, um, a support maintenance fee, a managed services fee, and a hosting fee. And the license fee we recognize per the IFRS 15 accounting rules once the software is installed. So right at the front of the engagement. Typically, these are five-year term contracts. So customers paying subscription over five years will rec recognize the license element of that um, as, soon as, as soon as the software is installed. The rest of those price elements, the support, managed service, and hosting, we recognize over the duration of the, in a straight, on a straight line basis, so the duration of the contract term. We're headquartered in London. We have about 320 people, and we have about 100 in London, 200 in India, in three different offices that we have in India. And we've recently opened a delivery center in Bulgaria, in Sofia where we have about 20 people today, but we're growing that office quite rapidly. And we've found a rich theme of resource to mine in Bulgaria, so that's working out well. Also, it gives us more people who have EU passports. So a lot of our business comes from Europe, and that's useful in terms of having ease of those people working in the rest of Europe. 
Today, we have around 80 customers in 44 countries. That's everywhere from Australia through to North America. We also have sales presences in Sydney and in Singapore and in Brussels. And we're in the process of putting a on the ground sales resource in North America. In terms of some high level numbers, these are half one, first half numbers, but usually a bit more than half of our revenue comes from software and a bit less than half comes from services. This is fairly consistent. Equally, a bit more than half of our revenue comes from Europe normally. Europe is, in our view, by far the most dynamic telecoms market. And the other half is usually split between Asia Pacific and the Americas. This particular half, we had a fair amount of revenue in the Middle East, mainly deriving from a big project we're doing for Orange uh, to to, uh, provide software for the new telecoms infrastructure in the new Egyptian capital city. We do have very sticky customers. Once our customers are on board, they tend to stay with us for a long time. This chart is showing that 81% of our customers have been with us for more than five years, but we have customers in our portfolio who have been with us for more than 20 years. It's a big process to move these customers to different platforms, so they tend to stay once they're on board. Why do telecoms businesses spend all this money and go to all this effort to have these solutions or to change these solutions? Now, I think there are three main drivers. One is revenue growth. So there's a huge amount of investment at the moment going to 5G rollout and fiber rollout. In order to recoup those investments and better monetize those investments, telcos need sophisticated software to help them build better product bundles to get closer to the customer and so on. So, so revenue growth is a key factor. And what we're seeing at the moment is two of the big drivers in this market are digital customer experience. So not just how do you save cost by getting customers to serve themselves, but how do you make it more attractive for customers to join your service to come on board as one of your customers rather than the next telco's customers, the competitor's customers. That's all about making it easy to use those self-service tools or those mobile apps that enable new customers to do that. And the other thing that we're seeing, which I've already mentioned, I guess, is that this need to be able to build more sophisticated product bundles uh, to be able to add loyalty schemes on top of that and then layer discounting schemes on top of that, both in business and consumer, is a, is a key to, again, generating more revenue to recoup the investments made in, in these huge infrastructure investments that telcos are making. Of course, all the other factors still apply. Obviously, operational efficiency, if you can consolidate a number of legacy platforms onto a modern convergent platform that can cover all of the different services and brands as our platform can, that's a driver. And of course, technology is always a driver in telecoms. If anything, technology is the driver in telecoms and telecoms businesses will always have to be able to offer the latest and greatest services if they're going to stay in business. So it's a factor too. And then of course, not all legacy enterprise software can cope with all the new infrastructure technology. So that in itself can drive change and customers to move to new platforms. I just wanted to draw attention to a recent Gartner report for some external validation. So Gartner, one of the big business analysts, they cover telecoms very widely. This is a report that came out last month in April, and it was a vendor survey, which we included it, included in, but it also surveyed the telecoms businesses and asked, um, asked telecoms companies, what are your priorities in choosing enterprise software? Priority number one for the market was digitization of sales and support channels. So that's all about this improved customer experience. And priority number two was support for new product types and business models, which is the second thing I was speaking about, i.e. it is all about creating more sophisticated product bundles to earn more revenue out of the same basic services. So it's interesting to get some external validation from Gartner on what we're seeing at the coal face. In terms of the markets that we're in, so the thing to know about telecoms is that you know not all telcos are like BT or Vodafone. There are all kinds of different telcos, and you know we have customers, you know, who are typical telco names you might recognise, like Three in the UK, KDDI, as like BT in Japan, Proximus is the BT of Belgium, and so on. But we also have customers who are not really telcos at all, like uh, so in the UK, Neos is the telecoms business of SSE, the, the power generator. Um, in Denmark, Norlis is another big electricity company, second largest uh, power generator in Denmark. But they're also the largest su- supplier of TV and broadband services to, to, um, to telecoms, to, to the telecoms market. Um, and they've recently, just a few weeks ago, announced that they're buying 
Telia, one of the Danish big Danish mobile operators, and are going to integrate that uh, into their business as well. So, so that's an you know that's a, a, a not not a telco you might think it was a telco. And then of course there are all the MBNOs, the brand based telco businesses. So think about things like Tesco Mobile, for example, that we call those mobile virtual network operators. And then we have you know emergency services networks around the world. They all have their own telco operations that need all of these software modules. So again, without going into vast amounts of detail, there are all kinds of different types of telco. And just going back to the previous slide, you can segment the market in lots of different ways. You can also look at it in terms of just scale. So, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three, and so on. And I think for the largest telcos, we are able to break into those through niches. So either by providing one or two of our modules and not the whole product suite, or by providing the whole product suite to one or two of that telco's brands. So that's the way we break into the big ones. And then the sort of more mid-sized smaller ones, we can provide the whole suite to all the brands. So there are different connect points and different places that we can operate in that market, which gives us a lot of diversity. In terms of channels, we also work through the channels. Channels are a lot less important than when I started out in this industry. Um, I think part of that is driven by the SaaS revolution. So because software vendors are providing software as a service ma mainly now, um, you know, the, the, the concept of going through a third party to have access to the service is not quite as, as obvious. So, so um, you know, tel tel certainly telecoms businesses, uh, we see want to go direct a lot more to the software provider. However, Nokia is an important channel for us in that Nokia can access some of the markets that it's harder for us to get to on our own, particularly in the Middle East, hence the deal with one with Nokia, the Egyptian capital, which we're currently working on. And that's a very interesting project. It would have been hard for us to 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 uh, to win um, with Orange without um, Nokia being involved, um, and also we we do work with the the big um, the big systems integrators, so people like Infosys, um, uh, uh, Cap Gemini, CGI, and Canada, and so on, um, on a, on a sort of a fairly opportunistic basis. But they do give us access to leads that we wouldn't necessarily always see, and um, they're also potential pools of resource to help us with projects on some of these larger deals. In terms of the competitive landscape, well, there is competition. The competition splits into three main groups. The large independent software vendors, so people like Oracle, for example, who have product suites in this area. And we tend to win against these much larger beasts because we're very focused on, as I was saying before, a product solution. Every customer has the same software. If a customer wants features we don't have, we, we won't give them a customized version. We will either introduce that feature through our own R&D program, or in some cases, um, customers will fund R&D to have that feature um, pr produced if it's not something we think that we want to invest in or something that we would do at a later date, but not right now. Uh, so a fair amount of R&D is, is customer funded. Um, and that's a, a useful source of product development. But that customer then does not have any, any IP rights in the software or any royalties. And, and that that feature is a product feature that all the other customers will benefit from. And that's an absolutely fundamental principle in our business model. Whereas, you know, most of these large independent software vendors are providing quite heavily tailored solutions. So they'll start from some product framework or a solution from a different site or a different customer, but they will then get into quite you know, heavily tailoring that solution, which obviously takes a lot more time. It's higher risk. It's more expensive. Then the middle group of competitors are the what we call the network equipment vendors. So that's Ericsson, Nokia, ZTE, and Huawei, the main ones in the world. The Chinese vendors are not in our current main markets, Europe and North America. They're still strong in the emerging markets, but we tend not to do very much in emerging markets. And uh, Nokia is a partner, so they're not really a competitor. Ericsson are a competitor, but have somewhat um, lost focus on their software business. Uh, so we, we're not seeing as much of Ericsson as we would normally do. Um, and then there are some smaller independent software vendors of the same sort of order, man order of magnitude size of ourselves, uh, but they tend to be more kind of regionally focused or focused on particular types of telcos. Um, so we don't generally compete much against, against the smaller ones. So just a quick couple of points about the six month period we're reporting on, and then I'll hand over to Andrew to go through that in some detail. We've had very strong trading, I think, in the first six months of the year. And we have hit record highs on all the key KPIs. You can see revenue, EBITDA, just PBT, net cash, all, all up. What I'll just spend a couple of minutes on is the orders and the sales side of things. So 
we achieved 15.3 million or a 40% increase in new orders compared to the same period last year. This is still lower than the, the high we had in 21. And the reason for that is that new orders in 2021 were heavily skewed towards the first half. So the total new orders for 21 was something like 30 million. Um, so whilst 15.3 is lower than 23, we, we, we're pretty confident that we'll um, exceed the, the total for 21 in 23. And a couple of points about that new order figure. So all of those new orders came from existing customers. The interesting thing is that we signed two quite substantial deals with existing customers uh, of a scale that you know, a few years ago would have been considered to be big new customer wins. So one of those we announced at £10 million, uh, the other one we announced at £6 million. And just to explain before I go on how 10 plus 6 doesn't equal 15.3, uh, in our new orders numbers, we don't include any support and maintenance sales. And that's because when we take new orders into back order, uh, we only we only we only include a year of uh, support and maintenance contracts in our in our back order. Uh, that's just so that we don't distort our back order. Otherwise, you know, we've got back orders full of contracts that are getting uh, sorry revenue that won't get recognised for for five years or so. So, so that's why there's a slight discrepancy. Um, of course, we we've done other other existing customer sales than those two big ones, and, and obviously that's a different number. But just to give you some colour around that, the the interesting thing about those two quite substantial existing customer sales is that they weren't to particularly large customers, and they certainly weren't to our large our largest customers. Um, and one of those customers have been a customer for for more than twenty years, so that's you know, really interesting and gives us a lot of confidence that we can um, you know, achieve keep this growth rate growing uh, and um, keep momentum moving when this customer base has this potential to deliver these kind of deals. So what was in those sales? Some of it was license capacity expansion where our customers are growing their bases. So as customers take on more customers themselves, they pay higher fees. Our subscription fees are directly linked to number of end customers. And so some of that was just growth, but also customers establishing new brands, new bases. And some of that was one of those customers that bought additional modules from us they hadn't bought all of the modules up front and went back now and bought the rest most of the rest of them and that not only generates digital license fees but it also generates additional services revenue seat services sales to put those modules into production in addition to that we had uh we, we had some evergreen sale of evergreen so evergreen is our subscription program where customers pay a quarterly fee, and that gives them uh, automatic access to upgrades on a regular basis, rather than those becoming a, a once every two or three year exercise that then becomes quite disruptive. And we're finding a lot of traction uh, in, in that with the existing base, uh, not to mention, of course, new customers who tend to take that automatically. And in addition to that, there was some extension of the term agreements that also generated more order value. So. A sort of corollary point to this is that what's interesting as well is that we're seeing the opportunity to convert older customers into more of the SaaS model through selling them not just evergreen, but managed services, for example, so that we take over running the software from older customers, IT departments. And I think you know we'll see more of that going forward. One final point before I hand over to Andrew, as you can see from this chart, this is our unweighted new customer pipeline. We were pretty confident we'll convert some of this in H2. So we'll also have new customer sales coming through as well. So again, that should help this order value to be a quite a high level, I think, for 23 as a full year. That is not a forward-looking statement. So we're very positive about the, the sales outlook. So I'll hand over to Andrew now to go into some more detail, give some more colour on, on the numbers. Andrew. Thank you very much, Lou. So as you can see from the graph in the top left-hand corner, revenue growth was very strong in the first half, increasing by 27%. That follows a 26% increase in the first half of last year. So really continuing the very strong trend that we've been seeing in recent years. Moving over to the right-hand side, it's interesting to see that adjusted PVT grew even faster than that. So this grew by 46% in the first half. So clearly we're benefiting from favorable operating leverage as the incremental revenue comes through. Part of the reason for that very strong operating leverage in the first half of this year was a lot of the extra revenue came from license sales. 
So as most of you will know, any incremental license sales will drop all the way through to profit at 100% because uh, there's very little additional cost associated with them. Moving to the right hand side, you can see that net cash performance remains very strong. Uh, net cash was £23.6 million at the end of the half. Um, and as a detailed slide, we'll come on to in a minute, uh, which looks at cash performance in a bit more detail. In terms of new orders, Louis already talked through the key points on the new orders. So there's nothing else I wanted to add to that. But if you look to the graph in the very middle in terms of the back order, you can see the back order remains very strong at £43 million. Now, this is made up of two components. First of all, £34.7 million of orders that have been contracted but not yet recognised. So essentially, this is you know, orders that we've got in the hopper that are ready to be turned into revenue um, and gives us very good visibility um, in, into revenue over the next few months. And on top of that, we've got £8.3 million of annualised support and maintenance revenue. So again, that £43 million you know, is very well covered. Um, to give, gives us very good coverage for revenue for the rest of the year um, and also going into FY24. Graph to the right of that shows the recurring revenue run rate. So this is increased by 34%, up to £13.1 million. Again, the increase in recurring revenue run rate has been faster than the increase in revenue of 27%. And this is showing that over time, Cerulean is becoming an increasingly higher quality business. Part of the reason for the increase in the recurring revenue run rate was the increase in managed service run rate, which you can see on the graph and on the bottom left-hand corner. This increased by 80% over the period from 2.5 up to 4.5 million pounds. We expect this growth will continue at these sort of rates into future periods. In terms of adjusted EPS, this really mirrors the adjusted PBT graph as you would expect, and just demonstrates again, the very strong operating leverage that we have got in the business. And the final graph on this slide shows dividend per share increased up by 27% to 3.3 pence per share and you know, demonstrates our continued progressive dividend policy. So in terms of the financial highlights, as I said before, revenue increased by 27% in the first half. The table here shows the breakdown of that revenue between software services and other revenue. And as you can see, the increase in the period was fully driven by an increase in software revenue. And that was mainly due to an increase in license revenue being recognized in line with IFRS 15. Another way of looking at that, the recurring revenue in the period was 6.5 million pounds. So that makes up 32% of the total revenue balance, which again was two percentage points higher than in the first half of last year. Again, reflecting back on the previous slide over time, you know, Cerulean is becoming a higher quality business. In terms of margins, gross margin increased by three percentage points, up to 81.5%. And the adjusted EBITDA margin increased by four percentage points to 48.9%. Again, the majority of this increase was driven by the higher proportion of license revenue that was recognised during the period. At the same time, there has been some increase in operating expenses, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, and this reflects mainly increased investment in headcount. Um, we're continuing to, to grow our, our, our headcount in order to ensure that we can continue to grow the business um, at these high levels into the future. As you'd expect, there also has been some element from higher inflation falling through, as well as other elements, including higher sales commission. Finally, you can see our very strong cash performance there. Again, net cash increasing by 43%, up to £23.6 million. So the next slide looks at the cash performance in a bit more detail. The table at the top shows a reconciliation of adjusted EBITDA down to free cash flow. What you can see there is that there has been some element of an increase in working capital in the first half. This is linked to the higher proportion of license revenue that we recognised. And this is something that we did flag as part of our FY22 results. So as we are recognising more license revenue, um, in line with IFRS 15, we have to recognise that revenue up front. But on a typical five-year contract, the customer will pay in equal instalments. So as we recognise the revenue up front, we have to recognise more accrued income on the balance sheet. But that will then unwind over the contract term. 
In terms of capex and net interest and tax paid, these balances were broadly in line with the prior period. So this is the key story for getting to free cash flow of £5.8 million. The graph at the bottom shows a reconciliation of opening net cash through to closing net cash. I think the key point here is that the free cash flow that we've generated is a lot higher than the amount that we've spent on dividends, on lease payments, and also from unfavorable FX. So consistent with prior periods, we have generated net cash. In terms of the consolidated income statement here, I've already talked through the increase in revenue and also the drivers for the increase in margins. So really just four additional points I wanted to mention here. First of all, is that we continue to invest in research and development. So over the full year, we expect to invest around 12,000 days into R&D. From an accounting perspective, in the first half, we capitalised half a million pounds worth of development costs. This was broadly the same as the amount of the amortisation charge that went through the P&L. So net net, there's been no overall benefit from capitalising these development costs. Secondly, as you can see, there was an increase in operating expenses of 18%. This was much lower, at only 13% after stripping out the impact of foreign exchange. But the fact that this was well below the increase in revenue at 27% shows that we continue to control our cost base very closely. Thirdly, in terms of the depreciation and amortisation balance you can see there, the 1.6 million includes half a million pounds relating to amortization of acquired intangibles. Now, this balance stems from the IPO and is now fully amortized, so therefore going into the second half of the year and in future periods, this balance will be closer to 1.1 million pounds, so around about 500,000 pounds lower than we've seen in the first half. Finally, on this slide, as we had anticipated, there was an increase in the effective tax rate this increased from 14.2% up to 19.4%. The 19.4% reflects our best estimate for the full year tax rate. And the main reason for the increase is the increase in the UK corporation tax rate from 19% up to 25%. In terms of the consolidated balance sheet, I think the key point here is that the balance sheet remains incredibly strong. You can see net cash of 23.6 million pounds there's no debt on the balance sheet as this was repaid in full two years ago. And overall, there was an increase in net assets of 38% from the prior period. In terms of the consolidated cash flow statements, this is mainly shown here for reference. You can see a reconciliation of adjusted EBITDA at the top of £10 million through to our closing cash balance of £23.6 million. I think the key point here is that cash generation remains incredibly strong you can see that cash has increased by 43% from the prior period. But I think most of the key points have been covered on the previous cash slide. Back to you, Louis. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. That's, that's great, thank you. So I won't say much more to summarise that a strong order book and strong pipeline, particularly for new customer business, gives us a lot of comfort about the future. And I think, you know, in terms of outlook, we're, we're, we're pretty well positioned. Um, uh, so that, that, that's really it from us. And uh, I guess the, uh, back to you, Townsend, floor's open for questions. What do you intend to do with the huge cash pile? Are share buybacks a possibility? So um, I, I think we, we, we buy limited amounts of shares to fund the, uh, the, our save, staff save as you earn share option scheme and the LTIP for the senior management team, uh, but they're relatively, relatively small amounts. Um, we're more likely to use that cash for acquisitions. And in acquisitions, we're looking for bolt-ons or tuck-ins, adding product that fits around the edges of our, of our suite, where we can um, bring in product that we can upsell to existing customers, or equally bring in new telco customers, we can cross our existing product set too. So, so that, that's more where the focus is. Also, it's worth saying that as we win larger customers with larger deals, that, that there's more focus on our balance sheet. And, you know, it, we, we, we do need to, be able to demonstrate that we, we have a strong balance sheet. So you shouldn't be all of that cash is available to be 
to be to thank be you very much and you talked about three classifications of competitors it sounds as if the competitors most similar to cerulean are the smaller software vendors how good is their service versus your own and how likely is it that one or more of these will do a cerulean and become real competitors by taking a high quality offering to a wider audience it's, that's a good question. Uh, I think we do punch above our weight. So, so we, we don't compete much with the smaller vendors. We compete really with the bigger ones. Um, I, I, it's a hard one. Um, I think the part of it is that, you know, if you go back to our DNA, we, we were founded out of what was a large software business. So we, 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 from day one, we had a lot of process and procedure and a sort of quality ethos um, that in a, in a lot of smaller startups, you just wouldn't find um, because of our MBO background. Um, I, I think also it takes a long time to get established in this market. It's taken us a long time to, to you know, to have this breadth of references and, and trust that we have. And, and you just have to have done a lot of successful projects to achieve that. So, so it's not impossible. And it, it, other smaller vendors might spring up, but there's a, there's a big entry barrier they've, they've got a hurdle to get to get to, to get to that point and are you currently working on a new module to add to your package so to increase sales to existing customers well we're constantly refreshing the modules and we're not working on a completely new module at the moment but we are you know, we've recently we've recently updated and upgraded our, our campaign management what we call cpq configure price quote which is a, a key part of the, the business the business sales process Done a lot recently on on uh, loyalty schemes, improving that functionality in our product, and of course at the moment we're looking at AI and and, and the, the the new the new features that that can provide to give us differentiation in the market. Not just on the productivity side, which is obviously a, a key part of AI, but um, you know, what new features can we bring in that that make use of the AI capability that's now available? So, how will AI be part of your business going forward? I think a AI will be a key part of of um, uh, production. So. What we're seeing now is tools that can write software modules and then test software modules. Of course, AI makes mistakes. So it's important that AI can not just write software, but, but um, test it. And uh, the analogy I use is you've got to think about software systems as, as sort of almost like Lego models. So let's say we're building the Eiffel Tower out of Lego. Um, you know, the, the AI will not be able to, to, to um, necessarily Put all the bricks in the right places to build the Eiffel Tower. If you just said, you know, build the Eiffel Tower, of course, probably not a great example because AI could look at a picture of the of the Eiffel Tower and 3D diagrams and probably do that. But you know, software being a more complex thing to design. Um, but what, what what AI can do is it can make the bricks. Uh, and if you think about, you know, maybe that model is a thousand bricks, and each of those bricks being a piece of code takes maybe five days to write um, and five days to test. Uh, that AI can do that work, and that's a lot of the kind of um, you know, the, the 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 coding that um, the the sort of well, I'm trying to think of a, of a polite way of putting it, but the 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 detailed you know production work, ma not manual work, but you know it's it's sort of lower skilled work than the design part, and um, you know that that not having to spend all that effort on on just the basic code cutting. And testing will, will save us a lot of um, a lot of uh, effort and, and increase productivity significantly. Uh, so it will have a big impact. And the current business focus is in the telco area. And as previously stated on the last presentation, you see plenty of opportunity for growth in this industry sector, which is a positive position to be in. That said, do you see a benefit of pursuing additional market sectors with similar needs where your existing solution could be tweaked to fit? So this would be a potential future growth strategy or would it need internal resource? And would that be a challenge to pursue? I think when you look at the share of the market we currently have in telco, you know, I, I would be surprised it was much more than 1% um, of the market. There's such a vast space for us to go into that, that right now our focus is on that and achieving greater momentum in this market. I think you could certainly adapt um, our software to, to, to other utilities, uh, electricity, water, gas, and so on. And in fact, some of our modules are used in other industries, but you know, really for the big transformation projects, you need a lot of domain expertise. 
So we're, we're experts in telco. We can go and do a digital transformation project in a telecoms business and you know, turn everything over. Uh, we don't have that domain knowledge or experience in electricity, water, power, gas, and so on. So whilst the software could probably do most of the fun- functions, we, we don't have the people who have the knowledge to, to, to make that happen. Do you encounter customer reluctance arising from fear of conflict in acting for potential competitors to existing customers? Not, not really, because it's it, we're, we're talking about software that's hugely configurable, and you know, the, even though every every customer of ours has the same product, um, they will have vastly different configurations of that product. So, you know, everything from the products that are defined, the workflow process that are defined, the sales processes, the front end that customers see, that's all configurable. Um, but also, you know, what does what the CRM screens look like? So, it, it can all be configured differently, uh, and, and it generally is. Um, to, to suit individual customers' um, needs, but all within the same code base. What's the size of the addressable market? Uh, uh, we don't have a reliable figure on that, and it depends a lot on, on you know, do you include China or not, and, and Russia's, the Russia's or not, and so on. And uh, there are different, if you go out and look at Gartner and, and some of the other analysts, they'll give you vastly different ranges of figures. So we, we just don't quote a figure, um, but it's a huge market. It's a huge market. I think you know different. You'll get different ranges from you know, two hundred million a year to a billion a year, or whatever. It, it it just depends what you look at. And what's the gross margin you'd expect going forward? So, i.e., half one appears to have benefited potentially from higher than normal license sales. That one for Andrew. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So, the gross margin in the first half of eighty-one percent um, has definitely benefited uh, from the, the high proportion of license revenue. So I think going forward into the second half of the year, uh, we would expect the proportion of license revenue to be slightly lower, um, and therefore we might expect the margin to be slightly lower. But you know, we're not expecting it to be significantly lower than the sort of levels that we have um, reported for the current period. And I think you know, looking over to the medium to long term, as we continue to win larger contracts with larger customers, we would expect the number of subscribers in our in our deals to continue to increase. And therefore, over the long term, we would expect the proportion of, of overall software to increase, which should drive a higher margins as well. And is there a concern that service revenues fell in half one? No, I, I think that the um, there was an awful lot of, of, of um, services work going on last year on new customer implementation. So we're doing five at once at, at one point. Um, so it, it, it's not a, not really a concern. There's always timing around those things, you know, and, and sometimes we're busier than others with new customer implementations where most of the service work happens. So I think it's really just a timing timing thing. And what proportion of software revenues come from upfront license recognition versus rateable recognition? So to give you a, 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 um, a, a rough idea, and this is all very round numbers, um, Typically, if you take a you know 10 million new customer deal, um, roughly 25% of that will be upfront license. This is a five-year term SaaS deal, and half of the rest of it will probably be uh, will be some something like half the rest of it will be project implementation services that are recognised over the term of the project. So typically 12 months, and the other half of that half will be the ongoing uh, uh, SaaS services over the five-year term from once it goes live. So that's a very rough rule of thumb way of thinking about it. And to what extent do you consult with current customers as part of the process of developing the product? And what are the pros and cons of this approach? Uh, we consult with customers a lot. We have a, essentially customer user group twice a year. Um, and we, we go through in detail the roadmap and what's on the roadmap for the foreseeable future. Need, we, 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 we showcase new developments, but also we ask for feedback on what customers think we should be doing and what concern, you know, what, what particular needs they have that they feel we might not be addressing yet. So that's a key part of our model. I don't think there are any, 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 any cons in consulting customers. And you mentioned that part of your revenues are from North America, but you're building the team in the US. Can you expand on your plans for the US and the benefit you anticipate from expanding the US team? Yeah, so so we're not building a delivery team. I mean, in the US, but we're we're putting some sales resource on the ground. I mean, we bear in mind we 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 do we do sell into North America, but we've done it based out of London um, most recently, and 
I, I think it's just about getting a little bit closer to that market by having boots on the ground. Um, I, I think that the, the challenges with the US market, particularly as opposed to North America in general, is that the, the, the telcos tend to be very large or very small. So too small is too small for us. And the very large are quite hard to break into. But but you know, but there is more diversity, I think, in that market than there has been in the past. So so we do believe it's worth um, investing more into trying to, to build a bigger customer base in, in North America. Analysts are forecasting earnings per share growth for the next two years to be significantly below the last two years' growth. Are you experiencing a slowdown in growth or just being cautious in your forecasts? I think we, I think there's a as people who know us will know we we are very conservative and we we have uh, we have um, you know we, the analysts reflecting our, our conservative approach I think um, I, I think all the analysts all the analysts have said there's upside risk in the forecast and you know in in broad brush we would expect the we're not expecting the current growth rate to slow um, so to the extent that's not not reflected in the forecast that's us being conservative and. Been a little reluctant to push the pedal to the floor until we until we see um, you know, the next the next new customer deal come in. I think it's it, again it's it's a timing thing really. Last question: How is inflation affecting costs now, and how do you see this going forward? Andrew, yeah. So so if we look at our cost base, I mean the vast majority of our cost base is made up of payroll costs. Um, so you're absolutely right. There has been an element of payroll inflation coming through in the current year. Um, and if we look at the sort of the, the, the spectrum of, of headcounts across the world, um, we, we've got people, you know, the majority of our people are in the UK, in Bulgaria and in India. Um, uh, earlier this year and last year as well, you know, the, the Indian market in particular was particularly hot. Um, so there was, you know, a fair amount of inflation coming through in India, but we are seeing that market cooling now. Um, and therefore, going forward, we would expect uh, to to increase pay costs by a lower proportion than we have done uh, in the current year. And that's the end of questions.